Hello. Excellent. Hello. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Good evening. Happy Easter to you all as well. Right? My name is Dr. Timothy Paul. I'm an associate professor of philosophy here in the program. And I, together with Gloria Frost, my colleague in the philosophy department here, would like to welcome you to this talk where we'll hear Father uh, Robert Barron talk to us. Dr. Frost and I are leading a multi-year grant founded gener uh, funded generously by the John Templeton Foundation. And it's to look into classical theism, the doctrine of God that's common to the traditional understandings of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And so we're looking into it in the following years. And part of that project is having talks like this talk. And part is having funding for researchers who want to look into the conception of God that's common to those traditions. And part of it is having workshops on it during the summers. Well, this is the first of two talks. And the second one is going to be by Father Robert Spitzer, past president of Gonzaga University and founder of the Magis Institute for Reason and Faith. And that'll be next year on December 7th here. So mark your calendars now for it. These public talks are intended to highlight the relevance of philosophical reflection about God to ordinary life. When Dr. Frost and I were discussing who would be best to bring out for this sort of talk, we immediately thought of Father Barron and Father Barron's work. Father Barron is well known for his Word on Fire Catholic ministries, the website for which gets more than one million hits per year. His 10-part documentary, The Catholicism Project, and its sequel, Catholicism, The New Evangelization, have been wild successes. The Catholicism Project takes Father Barron to 50 different locations in 16 different countries, where he discusses what it is that Catholics believe and why it is that Catholics believe what they believe. And furthermore, he shows us the artistic beauty and the spiritual beauty of the Catholic Church in all these places. It was broadcast on PBS and the stations across the country. And just today, I saw on his Facebook page, you have to keep up with him because things come out really quick. Just today, I saw on his Facebook page, a page which has over 450,000 followers, that he has announced a new film and new study program entitled The Mystery of God, Who God Is, and Why He Matters. But not only is Father Barron internationally known for his interaction with popular culture and for his catechetical work, he's also a scholar. He has a master's degree from the Catholic University of America and he's got a, in philosophy, and he's got a PhD in theology. He's authored no fewer than 10 books, one of which, Seeds of the Word, Finding God in the Culture, is currently a number one bestseller. I encourage you all to go buy two copies and give one to a friend. In addition to all this high quality output, he's a priest for the Archdiocese of Chicago, and he's the rector of Mundelein Seminary. I mean, one gets a distinct impression that Father Barron doesn't need to sleep with all the things that he has coming out. What Dr. Frost and I both found so very impressive about Father Barron's talks is his ability to draw on the Catholic intellectual tradition. And it's a deep inspiration for us here at the University of St. Thomas. He continually refers back to St. Thomas Aquinas, our institution's namesake, when expounding Catholic views. In his work on the seven deadly sins, he brings a Thomistic analysis of the sins, along with the helpful illustrations from Dante's Divine Comedy. I myself use his insights when I teach my own ethics students, as they'll learn in about two weeks' time. We'd like to thank the John Templeton Foundation for the grant that made this talk possible. We'd like to thank the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences over there, the Philosophy Department, Catholic Studies here at the University of St. Thomas, Campus Ministry, and the two seminaries here on campus for either help with funding or for helping us in other ways for this event. St. Thomas Aquinas, in his customary prayer before study, petitions God for five things. He asks for quickness to comprehend, memory to retain. He asks for happiness in expounding, a facility in learning, and copious eloquence in speaking. And I think you'll all agree with me at the end of this talk that Father Barron has received all of these gifts in great measure. So please join me in welcoming Father Barron, who's going to speak to us about Aquinas and why the new atheists are right. Father Barron. Thank you all. Thank you. 
That's very nice. Thank you for that kind introduction, Tim. And thank you for your presence here tonight, everybody, on this beautiful spring evening in Minneapolis. Huh? <laughs> I just flew from Chicago. I know about these uh, beautiful April evenings. Hey, listen, I'm so pleased to be here at this place. I visited, I think this is my third or fourth trip, as the microphone is collapsing. Um, and I've admired this place for a long time, admired many of the people who have taught here and studied here. Most uh, recently, our new Archbishop in Chicago is a graduate of this institution, so he asked me to send his best uh, to everybody. But you heard about the importance of Thomas Aquinas for me personally. Um, when I was a freshman at Fenwick High School, I was 14 years old, outside Chicago, and uh, one of my classmates is here, actually. Um, <laughs> it's true. I um, was in a, a, a you know, classroom with my friends, and, and one of the young friars presented uh, Thomas's arguments for God's existence. And I don't know why it was the case. I'm sure it impacted no one else in the room, but for me, it was like a bell going off. It was like a light turning on. And to think of God as someone real, and that came to me that day, and it's never left me. And the path I'm still on, the path of priesthood, the path of theology, the path of preaching and teaching is one that started that day at Fenwick High School. And it was under the aegis and inspiration of St. Thomas Aquinas. So whenever I can, I love to pay tribute to him and to do it here at the university named for him is a great uh, thrill. Um, you heard I've given this talk a rather provocative title, Thomas Aquinas and Why the New Atheists Are Right. Uh, and I hope in the course of this uh, presentation to make that clear to you. Um, don't worry, I am going to read this paper. I know it can be a little bit tiresome, but uh, I promise it's only about 45 minutes, so it's like one of your shorter classes up here. And then we'll have a chance afterwards for some, uh, some conversation. Let me get a little sip of water, and then we'll get going. The great English Dominican theologian Herbert McCabe, a favorite of mine, engaged a number of atheists in the course of his career as a public intellectual. Typically, he'd allow his interlocutor to make his opening statement, detailing precisely why he didn't believe in God. And McCabe would respond, I completely agree with you. The Anglican New Testament uh, scholar N.T. Wright tells of an encounter he had with a young undergraduate when Wright was chaplain at Oxford. The freshman said, Chaplain, don't expect to see a lot of me. I just don't believe in God. Wright asked him what he meant by God. And upon hearing the young man's account, he responded, I can assure you, I don't believe in that God either. Like McCabe and Wright, I've always found atheists of all stripes helpful, both spiritually and theologically, precisely in the measure that they clarify what the true God is not. They expose and implicitly undermine new forms of idolatry. One of the clearest in this regard is the father of modern atheism, namely Ludwig Feuerbach, who famously held that God is a projection of our idealized self-understanding, which is to say, a simulacrum of God made in the image of man, precisely what the Bible would have called an idol. The only thing particularly new about the new atheism is its nastiness. Christopher Hitchens, Richard Dawkins, whom Paul Griffiths, by the way, deliciously combined as Ditchkins. <laughs> Sam Harris, Daniel Dennett, they're numerous disciples. And by the way, they're everywhere on the internet. So my internet ministry with people in their 20s and 30s, their disciples are very thick on the ground. They borrow many of the intellectual insights of Feuerbach, Marx, Freud, Sartre, and Nietzsche. What they've added is a dismissive contempt for religion and religious people. Whereas Nietzsche and Sartre gave the impression they were in a battle with a pretty serious opponent, Ditchkins and company imply they're exposing the delusions of an idiot child. Nevertheless, they serve for our generation their essentially prophetic function of displaying idolatry. And this is continually needed since, as St. John of the Cross once said, the mind is an idol-making machine. There's so much we could say about the ruminations of the new atheists, so many ways we could engage them. Their obsession with biblical literalism, their deep concern about religion in relation to violence, their conviction that religion is irreconcilable with modern science, their conviction that faith poisons the minds of the young. Famously, they claim that religion is a form of child abuse. What I want to draw attention to, though, is one theme I take to be basic. One misunderstanding that conditions everything else they discuss, namely the view 
that God is a being among many, one cause amidst the range of contingent causes, a reality in the world whose existence or non-existence can be determined through rational, for them, scientific investigation. Christopher Hitchens, for example, delights in recounting the famous tale of the encounter between the Emperor Napoleon and the French scientist Pierre Simon de Laplace, the author of Celestial Mechanics. Having heard Laplace's exposition on the movement of the planets within the solar system, Napoleon reportedly asked why the figure of God did not appear in Laplace's schema, to which the scientist laconically responded, je n'ai pas besoin de cette hypothèse, I have no need of that hypothesis. The assumption of both Napoleon and Laplace was, apparently, that God is rightly understood as one of the mechanical causes that contributes to the motion of the planets. Perhaps the largest and most important cause, but still one among many. Though Napoleon seemed to favor the existence of such a cause and Laplace to deny it, both thought of God as fundamentally like otherworldly agents. We find something very similar in Richard Dawkins' The God Delusion. Dismissing Stephen Jay Gould's position that religion and science deal with qualitatively different dimensions of reality, hence the noma, non-overlapping magisteria, Dawkins opines that science can and must adjudicate the question of God's existence. He says, turning certain cosmological questions that seem to pass beyond the province of the sciences over to the chaplain makes as much sense as, quote, turning them over to the chef or the gardener. Here's how Dawkins characterizes the religious position, and listen carefully to how he lays it out. Quote, the God hypothesis suggests that the reality we inhabit also contains a supernatural agent who designed the universe and even intervenes in it with miracles. That's a direct quote now from Dawkins. And this is precisely why he can compare belief in God to belief in the flying spaghetti monster. Have you heard that phrase? Uh, it's everywhere on the internet. In fact, you can see it on people's cars now. People have the little uh, uh, fish that they're Christians and people put feet on the fish, they're for Darwin. Now they have the flying spaghetti monster on the car. Now, why does he say it? It's a fantastical imaginary being for whom there's not a trace of physical evidence and therefore the claim is made like God. And here Dawkins simply mimics his master Bertrand Russell who famously speculated that it's as impossible to prove the non-existence of God as to demonstrate the non-existence of a China teapot orbiting the sun between Earth and Mars. That's Bertrand Russell's example. What's so telling about both analogies, again, is that God is being compared to some agent or entity within the universe and operating alongside of other agents and entities. Dawkins concludes on the basis of this understanding of the divine that God's non-existence can be demonstrated to a very high degree of probability. If Occam's great principle holds, then God is not required, since we can explain most, if not all, worldly phenomena by appealing to worldly causes. Je n'ai pas besoin de cette hypothèse. Who needs the hypothesis of God when things can be explained naturalistically? This way of approaching God is on particularly clear display in the manner in which the new atheists assess the traditional arguments for God's existence that had such an impact on me when I was a young man. Both Hitchens and Dawkins dismissed Thomas Aquinas' arguments in favor of first mover or uncaused cause with the cavalier question, well then what caused God? The observation proves, of course, that neither thinker has grasped the nettle of the argument, but for our present purposes, it shows that both persist in thinking of God as one more cause in a chain of contingent causes. We see it as well in their preoccupation, and their, boy, their disciples, every day I hear this on the, on the internet, their preoccupation with, quote, the God of the gaps. All the new atheists revel in what they take to be religion's instinctive but pathetic retreat into the gaps in present day scientific accounts of reality. With some justification, they characterize intelligent design theory as just this sort of illegitimate move because we can't discern a clear and uninterrupted path by which certain living forms today evolve from lower forms, we assert that God did it. But what will happen to God so construed as the fo fossil gap closes or as our imaginations enable us to picture the evolutionary process more exactly? Dawkins laments the fact that while scientists try to clear up mystification, theologians seem to exult in it, playing temporarily in the darkness that science will eventually illumine. Once more, please, 
God is being thought of as a competing cause, ontologically at the same level as conventional, empirically verifiable causes. Now, the new atheists are far from reluctant to extrapolate from this metaphysical conception to what they take to be deeply disturbing implications for human flourishing. Representing as they do a supreme being, competitive with other causes, and brooding over the human project, the religions they claim foster a, quote, police state in which all aspects of the private and public life must be submitted to a permanent higher supervision. That's from Hitchens' book, God is Not Great. This God, I'll put it in quotes, watches and governs the world from the outside and imposes his rules on a recalcitrant human freedom. Hitchens seems to accept Sartre's famous syllogism to the effect that if God exists, I can't be free, but I am free, therefore God does not exist. Perfectly valid, the logic of that, by the way, but look at the assumption that undergirds it. This explains, Hitchens believes, why religion and political totalitarianism are usually closely allied. You'll find that argument again and again in the New Atheist. Now, that's their position. I maintain that the exertions of the new atheists in regard to God are, for the most part, an exercise in knocking down a not very impressive straw god. A god who dwells in or alongside the cosmos, who exists, whose existence or non-existence could be determined through scientific investigation, who might himself be susceptible of causal influence, who bears even the slightest resemblance to a flying spaghetti monster, and who presides over the human project in the manner of Kim Jong-il presiding over Korea, is simply an idol of the worst type. And it's Thomas Aquinas, the great patron of this university, that helps us to see it. One of the most remarkable features, as you know, of Thomas's doctrine of God is its agnosticism. In the prologue to question three in the first part of the Summa Theologiae, which deals with the divine simplicity, Thomas famously comments, I'm quoting, since we are not able to know what God is, only what God is not, we are not able to consider in regard to God how he is, but rather how he is not. That, that sheds light in every direction when it comes to reading Thomas. Though we say many things about God, we're not entirely sure what we mean when we say them. The Fourth Council of the Lateran taught that in regard to our speech concerning God, in tanta similitudine, maior dissimilitudo, in however great a similitude, there's an ever greater dissimilitude. Thomas picked up on this in making his distinction between the res significata and the modus significandi the thing signified and the manner of signifying. And this is why Thomas consistently prefers the negative path when speaking of God, taking away from the concept of God whatever belongs to creatureliness. Though, for instance, we can speak positively enough of God's goodness, we don't really know what we mean when we use the term. To say that God is eternal is tantamount to saying he's not in time. To say he's immutable is tantamount to saying he doesn't change in the creaturely manner. To say he's a spirit is to say he's not marked by matter. But what any of these terms signal positively remains quite mysterious. What precisely does it mean to be outside of time? I challenge you to tell me that positively. No one here below can possibly know. What precisely is it like not to be material? No one whose mind and senses are ordered to the realm of physical things can ever really grasp. The parables of Jesus can be read under this rubric. We say quite correctly that God is just, but in light of the parable of the vineyard owner who pays the same wage to those whom he hired at different times of the day, we find our conventional view of justice confounded. We say quite correctly that God is compassionate, but in light of the parable of the prodigal son, we realize the inadequacy of even our most generous interpretation of compassion. If we press the question, wondering precisely why the God of the Bible remains so mysterious, so resistant to description and nomination, think of the scripture, truly, O God of Israel, you are a hidden God. The answer lies in the opening line of the book of Genesis. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. 
Because God brought the whole of the finite universe into existence, God cannot be ingredient within the universe. He must be other in a way that transcends any and all modes of otherness discoverable within creation. Spatial distance, modal diversity, differences in grade, degree, kind, species, variations in speed, temperature, modal uh, diversity, none of these can begin to indicate the radicality of the difference that obtains between God and anything that God has made. In Catherine Tanner's language, God is not simply other, he's, quote, otherly other. To put it still another way, God's transcendence must be construed in such a manner that it precludes the possibility of contrast in the ordinary acceptation of the term. Nicholas of, Cusano, Nicholas of Cusa caught this when he commented that God, though radically not the world, still must be seen as the non aliud the non-other. And this is why Thomas Aquinas typically refers to God, not as en sumum, that means the highest being, but rather as ipsum esse subsistence, the subsistent act of to be itself. God's an infinitive essay, not ends, not a noun. If God were the highest being, then he could in principle be categorized alongside of other beings. Ipsum esse, however, is not the most powerful and impressive instance of the genus being. In fact, Thomas specifies that God cannot be placed in any genus, even the genus of being. He is, but not in the manner that creatures are, just the contrary. Creatures are analogs of God's essentially mysterious modality of existence. The technical term that Aquinas typically uses to signal this unique quality of the divine manner of being is simplicitas, simplicity. By this he means that in God there's no distinction between essence and existence, a distinction which perforce obtains in anything that God has made. To be a desk is to be a kind of being, namely that which is constrained by the essential properties of deskness. To be human is to be precisely a human being, an existent delimited by the form or essence of humanity. In both cases, I'm using Thomas's language here, the act of being, the actus ascendi, is, as it were, poured into the receptacle of a particularizing essence. And hence the things in question are, to that degree, metaphysically complex. But in God, the source of finite existence itself, there is no such distinction. Hence, God is not this kind of being rather than that. He's not in this category rather than that one. He's not great rather than small. He can't be placed, positioned, or indicated. In the strictest sense of the term, and Thomas insists upon it, he can't be defined, since definition necessarily implies delimitation. As David Burrell, who taught for many years at Notre Dame, put it, to be God is to be to be. He would certainly not fit, therefore, into any of the gaps in a conventional scientific account of things. You see why it's so silly even to entertain that possibility. We see now why Aquinas so consistently correlated the divine simplicity to the self-designation of Yahweh in Exodus 3.14. Moses was asking a commonsensical question. He was assuming, if you want, the mode of the scientist. Which God are you? What kind of being am I dealing with? God's answer from the burning bush, I am who I am, might be interpreted as off-putting. Stop asking me such silly questions. But see, Thomas reads it as darkly illuminating. My existence, who I am, is identical to my essence, what I am. And this is precisely why Yahweh told Moses that his servant should take off his shoes, for he was on holy ground. Holy, set apart, other, different. What becomes abundantly clear in this discussion is that the simple God is, Pache Ditchkins, never reducible to the level of a creaturely nature. He could never, even in principle, become the object of an empirical or scientific investigation. He could never be defined or categorized by an inquiring mind. He's about as far 
from a flying spaghetti monster as it's metaphysically possible to be. A passage in Thomas Merton's wonderful Seven Story Mountain comes to mind in this context. He's the other Thomas, by the way, that so influenced me when I was a kid. Thomas Aquinas and Thomas Merton. Merton read, almost by accident, Etienne Gilson's book, The Spirit of Medieval Philosophy, in which the subtle philosophical doctrine of the simple God is laid out. And the young Merton was stunned, for he'd always considered God, I'm quoting him now, a noisy mythological being. Huh, sounds like a flying spaghetti monster, right? He never imagined that the Christian understanding of God could be presented in a sophisticated way. It seems to me that the young Merton, before this intellectual conversion, had a good deal in common with the new atheist today. And now some words about the creator God and Aquinas. As I've been implying, it's only this simple God who can, in the proper sense of the term, create. Since creation designates the act of giving rise to finite being ex nihilo, out of nothing. That creation is a pivotal idea for Thomas Aquinas is evident throughout his writings. G.K. Chesterton caught this when he commented that Aquinas should be known as Thomas of the Creator. Getting right the absolutely unique way that the simple God relates to what he's made will go a long way toward clearing up the pseudo-problems raised by Hitchens, Dawkins, and company. Thomas's most thorough and technical treatment of creation occurs in question three of his great Questio Disputata De Potentia Dei on the power of God, which he composed in the mid-1260s while he was stationed at Santa Sabina in Rome. In Article 1 of Question 3, Thomas maintains that it must be firmly held, tenendum est firmiter, that God not only can, but does create ex nihilo. His justification for the claim rests upon the intensity of God's actuality. Every agent, Thomas says, acts in the measure that it is in act, which is to say in possession of some perfection of being. Thus a finite cause, fire, sunlight, a carpenter, produces a finite mode of existence, being secundum quid, determined in this way or that. Another way to state this is to say that a finite cause acts by moving, changing, or further specifying the being of another in some way. As I'm doing right now with you, I'm affecting, I hope, in some ways, your thinking. It's a very, very limited mode of causality. But God, who is totally actualized in his being, can affect things not simply through motion or change, but through bringing forth the totality of their being, through creating them ex nihilo, from nothing. In creating, as we know, God does not affect pre-existing reality in some accidental way. Rather, he brings the whole of that reality into being. Thomas insists that creation doesn't take place in time. A lot of these discussions, by the way, the Big Bang and all this business, I mean, the Big Bang is great. It, formulated by a Catholic priest, Georges Lemaitre, I'm all in favor of it, but it has very little to do with creation in the way I'm describing it, the way Thomas would describe it. Creation doesn't take place in time. Why? Time itself is a creature. Further, it doesn't occur within the theater provided by space because space is itself a creature. There's no matter or energy upon which God acts, since both matter and energy are creatures. As such, creation never appears to the senses, nor can it be measured, nor can it be specified temporally. It's better to speak of it as a continual act, as Thomas does, creatio continua. Not way back then, that's where deists wanted, I'd say atheists wanted too, way back then. No, creatio continua. It's happening moment to moment. As is true in the case of the divine nature, we know that creation is, but not really what it is. The anomalous, elusive quality of creation is reiterated in the third article of question three, which raises the issue of the locale of creation. That is to say, whether it's something really in the creature or perhaps between the creature and God. Thomas responds, the creation as an act is in God, since whatever God does is identical to what God is, given the divine simplicity. But creation in the creature is harder to pin down. 
For we can't say that it's simply received by the creature as an outside influence, since that would presume there's a receptacle that is not itself created. We can only say, and all this language always puts me in mind of a Zen koan, we can only say that God creates that which is receiving the act of creation. Hence, and here's Thomas's conclusion, creation is, quote, a kind of relationship to the creator with newness of being. Quedam relatio ad creatorum cum novitate ascendi. It's beautiful. It's a kind of relationship to the creator with novitas, freshness, if you want, of being. God's responsible, in short, for the entirety of a creature's being, yet his influence, this is so important, I think, is not external to the creature. And this is why Thomas speaks of it as quedam relatio. It's a kind of relationship. He was well acquainted with the Aristotelian notion of relationship as an accidental qualification of two or more substances. We're having that right now. I'm in front of you. You're over there. I'm speaking to you. You're listening to me. There are, there's a number of relationships that apply to us accidentally. Thomas is using Aristotle's language, but he's, he's speaking of fractured Aristotle ease. If he does when speaking of the Eucharist, Thomas here uses Aristotelian language, but in a decidedly non-Aristotelian way, signaling that something else, metaphysically speaking, is the case. You know, that the substance changes while accidents remain the same? Well, that's gobbledygook from an Aristotelian standpoint. It's using Aristotelian language, but it's precisely the opposite for Aristotle. Something very similar here, relationship as an accident between substances, that can't be the case in regard to God's relationship to us. God is therefore properly discovered as the deepest ground of a creature's ontological identity. Merton, again, was entirely in a Thomist frame of mind when he famously said that contemplative prayer is, quote, finding that place in you where you are here and now being created by God. If you take nothing else from my talk, take that from Merton. Uh, contemplative prayer is finding that place in you where you are here and now being created by God. It's entirely Thomist in inspiration. This clarification, I think, is of enormous importance as a preliminary response to the atheist contention that the human rapport with God can only be one of abject submission to a tyrant. You see how it's just the opposite. I'll come back to that. The creator is certainly other than the creature, Yet his otherness is congruent with his absolute closeness to the creature. Thomas holds the transcendent God is, quote, in all things by essence, presence, and power. And then he adds intime, intimately so. His lordship over creation, rightly named, is simultaneously the most gentle letting be of creation. Creatures don't so much have a relationship to God they are a relationship to God, which is why Meister Eckhart, the great uh, mystic, who sat in Aquinas' chair of theology in Paris for a time, said the best way to find God is to sink into him. It's the same metaphysics behind that idea, to sink into God, to find the place in you where you are here and now being created by God. John Milbank and many others in recent years have drawn out a most important feature of this teaching Namely, that creation ex nihilo, from nothing, is an essentially nonviolent act. In most of the mythology of the ancient world, creation takes place through a primordial act of violence, God or the gods wrestling some enemy into submission. The philosophical accounts of Plato and Aristotle represent a more sophisticated version of this myth in the measure that they picture a divine figure, think of the demiurgos of Plato or the prime mover of Aristotle, shaping matter into form. But there is none of that in the doctrine of creatio ex nihilo. God cannot even in principle wrestle some alien and recalcitrant opponent into submission or shape from the outside in an intervening way sub substance standing opposed to him. Rather, he brings the whole of finite reality into being nonviolently. The biblical narrative here, I think, is quite telling. 
God doesn't fight the world into existence. He speaks it into existence. Another question that can be explored under the rubric of the divine creativity is this. Why precisely does God create at all? If, as Thomas insists, God in his perfection is utterly self-sufficient, why would he feel obligated to give rise to finite being? One way classically to solve this problem is to dissolve it and say that God creates because he had to. The medieval Arabic philosopher Avicenna, for example, argued that creation is a kind of automatic emanation from God. In saying this, he anticipated by eight centuries the dialectical theology of Hegel and by nine centuries the process theology of Whitehead and his disciples. But with this sort of emanationism, Aquinas has no truck. While natural causes that act through necessity are determined toward the production of one kind of effect, think of a plant that gives rise predictably to seed after seed, causes that act through intelligence and will produce, Thomas thinks, a wide variety of effects. Think here of Picasso or James Joyce. God's production, obviously, is wild in its fecundity and diversity, and thus it follows for Aquinas that God's mode of creativity is not automatic, but intelligent, purposive, and artistic. Thus, God chooses with artistic intent to give rise to the universe, but he does so in utter freedom from self-interest. And this implies, necessarily, that God's creative act is a gesture of love. For love, and here again I'm quoting Aquinas, is the willing of the good of the other as other. Since God has no ontological need, any and all of his actions ad extra are for the good of the other, absolutely, perfectly. Therefore, the world, if I can sum this up, has been spoken into being non-violently and lovingly. In response to certain Hegelianizing tendencies in the theology of the 19th century, the First Vatican Council reiterated this point, stating that God creates not out of need, but simply out of a desire to share his goodness and glory. Here again we can see how far this Thomistic sense of God is from the caricature proposed by the new atheists. The creature's relation to the creator God cannot be crushing and oppressive, despite our imaginings. Instead, it is the very act by which the creature subsists. More to it, this act has to be fundamentally nonviolent, non-intrusive, non-aggressive, and it's done out of sheerest love. That's Christian metaphysics. Pace all the new atheists. Please, especially young people, please don't believe them. I mean, they, they're parading this stuff all the time, and they're, as I say, their disciples are very thick on the ground, but they don't know what they're talking about in terms of our great metaphysical tradition. Okay, just a few words now about Thomas's view of providence with all this in mind. Having sketched Aquinas' treatment of the divine simplicity and creativity, I want to examine now, however inadequately, one more major motif in Thomas's doctrine of God, namely his teaching concerning the relationship between divine causality and creaturely causality. The problem is a vexing one, and much hangs upon its resolution. As we clearly see in the New Atheist, the modern mind reacts against any claim that God interferes with the movements of nature or the movements of the human intellect and will. The objection is theoretical, for don't the natural sciences and psychology adequately account for these phenomena? But it's also existential. A competing supernatural cause seems to be an intolerable affront to finite freedom. Again, think of Sartre. What I've been exploring more abstractly now becomes focused and concrete. How exactly does the non-competitiveness of God play itself out in terms of specific interior and exterior events? I'll first observe that Thomas speaks of God as both creator, the one who gives rise to the whole of the universe from nothing, and as mover, the one who directs particular creatures and creation as a whole to their appointed ends. And he sees no contradiction or tension between the two characterizations. God indeed affects creatures at the deepest possible level of their existence 
and in relatively secondary ways as well. Now, when God moves or otherwise affects a creature, he's not strictly speaking creating. However, he never ceases to be the creator. And see, what this means is the non-competitiveness that obtains in regard to the unique act of creation holds analogously in regard to less dramatic instances of the divine influence. Thomas explores this matter in detail in the seventh article of that famous question three of the De Potentia. The topic for discussion is whether God operates in the operations of nature. The dilemma should be clear. If God is the creator of the entire universe in every detail, what room is left for the free exercise of creaturely agency? Wouldn't the presence of the creator simply absorb any purposeful causality outside of himself? That's a good question, by the way. And a lot of the finest minds theologically in the West have wrestled with that. The said contra to this article could function as the leitmotif of my entire discussion tonight of the God-world relationship. Thomas quotes the prophet Isaiah. O Lord, it is you who have accomplished all that we have done. If you, if you let the full ramifications of that statement uh, e echo in your heart and mind, you'll understand what Thomas is trying to get at here. Oh Lord, it's you who have accomplished all that we have done. Mind you, no competition between the two. There it stated clearly and unapologetically, the dimensions of created and uncreated causality are placed side by side. We have really done certain things, and yet they've been accomplished in us by God. This sort of juxtaposition is possible only on the assumption that God and creatures are not competing for space on the same metaphysical playing field. I mean, I can't say I've done what you've accomplished, can I? Because we were both on the same metaphysical playing field. You've got your space, I got my space. If I totally invade your space, I'm aggressing you, right? I have accomplished what you've done. Well, then you haven't really accomplished it. But see, we can say it about God because of the peculiar way that God is other. That's what we're driving at here. The high paradox, once more, is that the very strangeness and otherness of God is what allows for God's close cooperation with finite agency. In the course of his respondio, Thomas lays out a number of models for understanding the synergy between divine and non-divine causality. I'll look here only at one. One thing he says can operate in another in the measure that the former provides the latter with its virtus or power, as say when the sun influences a solar heating device. Now God certainly acts in this way since as creator he continually provides not only power but being to all his creatures. He's the condition for the possibility of their being and acting in the first place. But then Thomas adds this, I'm quoting, the higher the cause, the more common and efficacious, and the more efficacious, the more profoundly it can penetrate into the effect. The higher the cause, the more common and efficacious, and the more efficacious, the more profoundly it can penetrate into the effect. A finite cause can influence another finite cause, but the infinite creator, who's the sheer active to be itself, can penetrate utterly the effect, acting thoroughly, but non-obtrusively in the agency of that effect. And with this clarification, we come to the heart of the matter. In our ordinary experience of instrumental causality, the using cause invades the being of that which it uses. But God, precisely as the creative cause of all that exists, can use finite causes instrumentally, but yet non-invasively. Of course, the most interesting instance of this dynamic, at least from our perspective, is the manner in which God works in and through the moves of the human free will. Aquinas is convinced that God moves human wills in such a way as to achieve his purpose and that this providential direction in no way compromises human freedom. This is the case because God doesn't push or pull human wills from the outside as much as he energizes them from the inside. Freedom is not unmitigated spontaneity, but the ordered pursuit of the good in accord with the deepest desire of the free subject. 
The otherly other God can operate at the level of the ground of the will, luring it in accord with its own most nature, and hence can enable the human subject to be itself precisely through surrender. To get that is to get a lot of Christian spirituality. The reason it sounds so anomalous and strange is people don't get the metaphysics that's behind it. It's fascinating to me how this non-competitive play is consistently displayed in the biblical narratives. Yahweh acts in human affairs, but not typically in an interruptive way. Rather, he accomplishes his purposes precisely through the play of human freedom. The narratives concerning David are particularly instructive here. There's very little of the explicitly supernatural in those stories. Go back to 1 and 2 Samuel, the David cycle. Yet Yahweh is clearly presented as achieving what he wants, as acting and achieving what he wants. That achievement takes place in the densely textured political and psychological drama involving Hannah, Eli, Samuel, Saul, Jonathan, and David. The story is, on one level, completely understandable in political and psychological terms, yet the author of the Samuel cycle wants us to penetrate to the deeper level of the divine agency. Because the highest cause is not a being among many, it can operate in the realm of beings non-violently, or as the Book of Wisdom has it, sweetly. God's wisdom stretches from end to end mightily and orders all things sweetly. See, that biblical idea is being given philosophical heft by Aquinas. We see again how the atheist concerns about the God of the gaps who tyrannizes the human project from without are, at least from the perspective of the patron saint of this university, completely misplaced. Just, I promise, two more pages. A little bit on where we got off the rails, how this thing gets so messed up. One might be forgiven for wondering how things got so confused. How exactly did we get from Thomas's subtle metaphysics of the divine simplicity and non-competition to the overwrought and misplaced preoccupations of the new atheists? A good deal of blame, I think, can be assigned to the option that happened in the late uh, 13th into the 14th century for a univocal over an analogical conception of being. Within the limits of this very brief presentation, I can hardly do justice to the complexities of that shift in epistemology. But suffice to say that once being is posited as a univocal term, God and creatures had to be categorized under the same general metaphysical heading as modalities of being. Though he was supreme, infinite, all-powerful, God, on this reading, was one reality alongside of others, and hence necessarily competitive with them. On Aquinas' reading, which is an analogical conception of being, all creaturely things were linked to one another through their shared centeredness in the creative ground of existence. But on the univocal interpretation, the totality of being is made up of mutually exclusive and essentially unconnected individuals. William of Ockham's famous summary line, Praetor illas partes absolutas nulla res, that means outside of these absolute parts, there is no real thing. And one of the absolute parts he's talking about is God, the supreme being. See, but that's a revolution in epistemology and metaphysics, which led to a lot of mischief in my judgment. As the late medieval world gave way to the modern, this conception of the God-world relationship became unhappily solidified. Even as God was affirmed by the modern philosophers, and most of them, Descartes, Leibniz, and so on, are, are believers, um, so philosophers from Descartes to Leibniz to Thomas Jefferson, he was more and more imagined as a distant being who had a mechanistic relationship to natural causes and an interruptive relationship to human freedom. See how that happened? You see it haunting the minds of all the modern philosophers. But the ever more precise specification of the physical forces involved in cosmic movement conduced toward an ever more abstract and distant view of God. And the ever greater assertion of human freedom conduced first toward the marginalization of God and finally to his elimination. Commencing with Feuerbach, atheist philosophers began to say that the no to God is the yes to man. And the trajectory finally reached its, um, its fulfillment in Sartre's famous uh, syllogism, to which I alluded above. It's only the competitive supreme being, the unhappy offspring of the univocal conception of being, 
that could possibly be the object of that kind of contempt. The God articulated by Thomas Aquinas is a competitor neither to the mechanistic causes named to the physical sciences nor to a robustly functioning human freedom. Rather, he's the one whose glory, in the words of St. Irenaeus, is a human being fully alive, and by extension, a cosmos operating according to its own principles, laws, and rhythms. God delights in human freedom. God delights and glorifies in the integrity of the natural world. They're not at odds with each other. Just a couple paragraphs now of conclusion. Through my wrestling with the new atheists in both academic and popular contexts, I become convinced that the Catholic Church in the years following Vatican II has been rather inept at presenting its own textured and intellectually satisfying understanding of God. As I've tried to demonstrate in this brief paper, the contemporary atheists are doing battle essentially with caricatures, and therefore it is altogether right to say to them, as Herbert McCabe did, you're absolutely right. But this is not enough. We have to get much better, and I'll say it now as a little fervorino here at the University of St. Thomas. We've got to get much better at giving a reason for the hope that's in us. We've got to get much more adept at articulating our belief in the simple God whose otherness is enhancing to the world and not competitive with it. We have to formulate a new fundamental apologetics. When I was coming of age in the years just after the council, apologetics had a very bad name. It was defensive, rationalistic, unbiblical, and above all, disrespectful of other religions. Furthermore, my post-conciliar teachers and formators were enthusiastic advocates of a positive engagement with the environing secular culture, even going so far as to suggest, according to a slogan of that time, uh, happily uh, fallen into desuetude now, that the world sets the agenda for the church. But see, all this was exaggerated and one-sided. Every culture, very much including our own, is evangelically ambiguous. That is to say, to some degree amenable to the proclamation of the gospel and to some degree quite inhospitable to it. Simply to pursue a culture and seek accommodation to it, therefore, is never a healthy evangelical strategy. My own conviction is that during these years when the church was running after the secular culture, that culture was not the least bit eager to reciprocate. Instead, it went about its business more or less indifferent to the church, which was, which was ardently pitching woo in its direction. And then in the wake of September 11th, and it's no accident whatsoever that the new atheist phenomenon is a post-September 11th phenomenon, because see, it revived the old enlightenment argument. Religion's irrational. Therefore, the only way for religious people to adjudicate disputes is through violence. So the minute those planes flew into those buildings on September 11th, people said, look, there it is. There is religion. Irrational, therefore violent. And that's when the new atheist phenomenon really emerged. Um, so in the wake of that, uh, a, a significant portion of the secular world, led by Ditchkins and company, turned aggressively against religion in general, but Christianity in particular. And when they did so, we found ourselves ill-equipped to defend ourselves, having long before jettisoned our own evangelical and apologetic tools. Ironically, and I'm proud to say it here, it's the pre-modern doctrine of Thomas Aquinas that provides the surest foundation for this evangelical apologetics in our postmodern world. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Thank you. Thanks. That was great. <laughs> very edifying, very, th very thought-provoking. We have some time now for questions, and so you see there's two microphones set up up here. Uh, what we'll do is we'll just go back and forth between the mics, taking questions, one from each mic, until we run out of time, and then we'll call it quits. But uh, join me again in thanking Father Barron, and then we'll have questions. So thank you. Thank you all. Thanks. Please. 
Hi, Father. Um, I'm the Fenwick student, um, but I just wanted to ask... Uh, oh, you're a Fenwick did, student? Yeah. Is that right? Yeah, I graduated in 2011 from hey, Hinsdale, St. Isaac's. Yeah, good. Yep. <laughs> That's nice. Um, Friars, yeah. <laughs> so I just wanted to ask, um, what do you think is the... I'm writing my Philosophy of God paper on it, but what do you think is the best Catholic response to the evidential problem of evil? To the what now? The, the evidential argument from evil? Well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's the most serious objection to God there is. And I think Aquinas knew that. Um, I still think the Augustinian resolution is the best one. You know, uh, once we get the language of permission clear, God doesn't cause evil, he can't. Evil is a, a mode of non-being, but God permits it to bring about a greater good is a perfectly fine way to state the thing abstractly. Uh, in a pastoral setting, it takes on a whole different coloration. But I think from a um, theoretical standpoint, that's fine. Secondly, I'd say this, along with some of the apologists today, that in a certain way, it's not a serious intellectual objection. Because how could a finite mind ever claim to know that there's insufficient reason in an infinite mind? And, and I think that's what you're always up against. If you say there can't be a God because a, a God of infinite goodness would never allow such a thing. Well, see, how do we possibly be in a position ever to make that claim? So I, I totally understand the emotional texture of the objection. I totally get it. Everybody feels it. I feel it. But from a strictly intellectual standpoint, it, it really dissolves once you pit a finite mind against an infinite mind. Um, years ago, when I was doing a pastoral work, there was a young father came to me, and he said, Father, what's breaking my heart is my little son, he's three, he had some physical problem, I forgot what it was, but he had to go in for surgery. And so the kid went through surgery, and then in the, in the aftermath of the surgery, he was in such discomfort. And there his father was in the hospital room, and he said, Father, he's looking at me with this look of, why, why are you presiding over this? I mean, you can't do something about this? Why are you putting me through it? And he said, what broke my heart was, I couldn't even in principle explain to him what surgery was, why you'd need surgery, why you have to recover, et cetera, et cetera. And when he said that, a light went off. Like, well, that's a perfect analogy for our relation to God. Is there we are saying in a million ways, how could you possibly be presiding over this, this uh, catastrophe? But just as the, the qualitative difference between the mind of that kid and his father, we're now to the infinite degree, the qualitative difference between our minds and God's. I mean, so that's a, a, a standard, but I still think valid way to look at it, you know. Please. Uh, thank you, Father Barron. Just strictly a philosophical question. You were talking about uh, the distinction where we, there's no contradiction between, between saying God is a mover and a creator. Uh, I think it was uh, Maimonides that like spoke on like when we speak of God's essence, we can't like super add anything to that. We can say God created, but we can't say he's a creator too. So I'm just wondering what Aquinas would say about like adding the creator and the mover to his essence. Is that like kind of like partializing the essence of God or what would he say about that? No, because right, neither one belongs to the essence of God. Otherwise you're into some kind of emanationist schema. So right. you can't say that. They both deal with some move ad extra. But see, I think what he, what he means there is that his activity as mover is not metaphysically incompatible with his being as creator. And so therefore, it's got a non-competitive quality. So when Thomas talks about movement, whether it's like efficient causality or final causality, it's always under the aegis and rubric of his fundamental identity as creator. Both name an odd extra relationship, so neither one's reducible to his essence, but they're, um, um, they're compatible because he remains creator as he moves, you know? Um, so it wouldn't be the Maimonides issue so much, but um, it's the two of them are, are um, non-contradictory when it comes to God's activity ad extra. Something like that. Please. Hi, thank you, Father. Uh, so Tom was talking about the problem of evil, and I, I kind of want to go there again. Um, so you've, you've talked about God's influence uh, and like work in the world as this, this other. And he influences and works by uh, just this like really deep and pervading way, right? Um, so if he influences our wills in that way, like you were saying, by energizing, um, can we say that God's will is always fulfilled in that way? And if so, uh, how do we account for evil? Yeah, no, I mean, you're, you're touching on one of the most complicated issues. For example, God's, but it is, I mean, how do you, you talk about God's um, universal desire for people to be saved, for example? Is that reconcilable with some people falling away from it? Does God permit 
sin. I mean, clearly he does because it, it's a fact of life. Um, press that question, may we hope that God's universal salvific will will be realized? Yes, it seems to me. Um, is that contradictory? No. Um, and see, what I'd press on is this. God's moving someone to salvation is not incompatible with that person willing salvation because God moves precisely through the free will. Now, let me give you a real concrete example of it. Uh, my students at Mundelein know this, that I'm a, a big Bob Dylan fan. Bob Dylan is, is my guy, you know. Suppose um, a student at Mundelein came to me and said, Bob Dylan is appearing with his band at 8 o'clock on Friday night in the Mundelein Auditorium. Would that get me to the Mundelein Auditorium? Yeah, of course it would. I mean, ineluctably, and he would know that. If he wanted me there, the one way to do it would be arranged to have Bob Dylan and his band appearing, right? But would you ever say, I went there under coercion, or I went there against my will? No, on the contrary. Is a good was proposed to my will that was so compelling that I followed it, you know? Now, that goes back to Augustine's example of the, uh, of the leafy branch that draws the, uh, the animal. Uh, so what God does is he, now, from within... God who knows you better than you know yourself. So I can say, yeah, I love Bob Dylan. If someone had Bob Dylan at the, at the auditorium, I'd be there. But now God knows everything about everything. He knows every desire of my heart. He knows every longing of my body. He knows everything about me. Can God get me to do what he wants? Yeah, in a way that is utterly congruent with my freedom. Yes, yes. And there's another instance of the non-competitive causality of God. But that's a quick answer to a really complicated question. Okay. Thanks. Please. Uh, thank you for the talk, Father. You addressed new atheism, which is a very popular American heresy, but I want to ask you about another one. Yeah. Um, there's, a, there's a good deal of the population of America for whom God exists, but he does not matter much. Yeah. The Deepak Chopras, the yeah. Oprahs, Joel Osteen, and what have you. And while... <laughs> And while the new atheists are filling up the comments on your YouTube page, I think the people who run YouTube probably belong in the Oprah camp. Yeah. So my question is, what are the implicit metaphysical assumptions of this God that exists but doesn't have any effect on my moral and especially yeah. sexual life? And uh, what ways does St. Thomas help us address them? Yeah. Probably yeah. in public debate. Yeah, good. No, that's helpful. Someone said that if Oprah married Deepak Chopra, she'd be Oprah Chopra, <laughs> which <laughs> always struck me as a happy uh, resolution. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm with Thomas in saying this, that all these movements, including the atheists, are all on to something. They're getting some aspect of it. I, I think the Deepak Chopra thing is a kind of um, uh, pantheism, a sort of a pantheist mysticism, let's say. Are the pantheists right? Yes, in the measure that they're intuiting something. They're intuiting what Thomas would say, God's presence to all things in the most intimate way. Is God ubiquitous, omnipresent, and in all things by essence, presence, and power? Yeah, says Thomas Aquinas. So ipsum esse, is ipsum esse in this room? Well, no, in one sense, because this room is filled with beings. That's all that's in this room. God's not a being. So God's not in this room. God's totaliter aliter, right? Totally other. But is ipsum esse in this room? Of course, in the most intimate way, because God is here and now giving rise to the being of this room. I would argue that the pantheists, ancient and modern, are intuiting that. They're getting that, they're, but in a confused way. Because what they're confounding, to use Thomas's language, is ens commune with ipsum esse. Ens commune, being in general being in general. So Spinoza sort of pantheism. That's what God is. Deus sive natura, says Spinoza, right? God or nature. They mean the same thing. Well, no. Uh, God is ipsum esse. Nature is, is, the, is the sum total of beings. There's an intimate relationship between them, but it's not identity. Uh, but the pantheists are getting something right. You're furthermore right in intuiting that they turn God in sort of a bland force. So the Star Wars thing, uh, uh, George Lucas got it from Joseph Campbell. You know, Joseph Campbell, the comparative mythologist, who was asked, do you believe in a personal God? He said, no, no, I believe God is the zoom of energy that runs through all things. Now again, is that getting something right? I'd say yes, 
But it's, it's getting something deeply wrong at the same time. You know, it's reducing God to ens commune. Um, so metaphysically, I think that's where they, in my judgment, where they come. They're getting something right, but not the total picture. Because the real God is a person who has a personal relationship with us, who's moving us and shaping us according to his purposes. Uh, that's not the abstract uh, pantheist principle, you know. Please. Thanks, Father. I just have a question about um, a problem of language. Uh, you spoke about God being um, beyond categories and non-definable. Um, and it seems that there is a problem that you run into in even being able to speak about God in the first place. And, yeah. and how do we resolve this issue that your entire talk just made sense to me, um, but under those kind of definitions of God, it seems like any utterances about God would be meaningless. Yeah, because that's taking it too far. Uh, it's, it's right to say God can't be defined, and that's Thomas Aquinas from page one of the Summa. You can't set limits to God. But can you set certain language on a trajectory toward God? Yes, and can you recognize that as relatively adequate compared to other types of language that are on a wrong trajectory? Yes. So that's the way to play it, I think. We can never name God the way I can name you. So I can start naming you right now just by looking at you. If I looked you up on Google, I'd find out more about you and i talk to people that know you. I can start naming you, you know, more or less clearly. I can never name God that way, but I can send certain words on a trajectory that are going toward God. But he always remains, as I say there, agnostic. You know, it's what we don't know about God that really matters. Um, but we can say with relative adequacy, I think, certain things about God. Thank you. Okay. Yes, sir. Thank, thank you, Father. You're uh, I was wondering if you could say something about miracles, because uh, there's a lot of, of, of hatred and abhorrence for the idea that God can act directly within his creation, both from the atheists and even within lots of modern theology. People yeah. want to really restrict God's action within creation down to the bare minimum necessary yeah. to have orthodox faith in Christ. Yeah. Uh, could you help me understand the source of that hatred and then say something about how we should think about miracles in, yeah, in relation good. to that? And go back at least to David Hume, you know, whose book is still influential, and, but to me, the argument of it has not improved with age. It was bad in the 18th century and has not gotten any better, in my judgment. Um, <laughs> But yet it's still, I mean, undergraduates all across the country read David Hume on miracles and think that settles the issue. Um, yeah, here's the quick thing I'll say. Um, can we talk about God's presence in ever-increasing uh, intensity? So is God present right now? Yes, sustaining, moving, um, influencing all of us right now. Absolutely, I couldn't do this without God. I couldn't think, I couldn't speak without God. In you we live and move and have our being. Uh, Lord, you search me, you know me, you know my resting and my rising. I mean, so all of that is true. But then can we talk about more and more intense uh, expressions of God's uh, influence and presence? Yeah. Why can't God concentrate things in a very intense way? And call that the miraculous if you want. Uh, I'm with Augustine who says it's not so much the violation of the laws of nature, but a speeding up and intensification of the logoi within nature. You know, his famous example of the... Um, um, changing the, the water into wine, right? Augustine says, it happens all the time. Rainwater comes down, it goes into the earth, comes up through vines, becomes grapes, which gets crushed and fermented, and they become wine. It happens all the time. <laughs> but what happened at Cana was it happened very intensely and quickly and with a certain spiritual purpose. His point there is that we don't have to play the game of God like breaking into his own creation. Tayar said that, it's a, that God enters his creation the way an artist enters his studio. The artist doesn't break into his own studio, you know? So I would say that, the non-competitiveness, but then can God express his presence in a very focused, intense way? Yes, and that's the miraculous, I'd say. Please. Thank you, Father. Can you say something about uh, philosophy and theology and how to make them more than just academic disciplines, but how to make them food for prayer? Yeah, good, and uh, you're right, that's a good intuition. Um, I'm with um, Pierre Adot, do you read his books? You know, the great student of, of classical philosophy who said that um, in the ancient world, philosophy was a, was a bit loss. It was a way of life. And that comes true, through in Plato, doesn't it, really clearly. We think, oh, I'm studying Platonic philosophy. 
Well, because see, we've all, our educational system is predicated upon uh, Schleiermacher's University of Berlin, circa 1815. Professor comes out, like I am, at a podium and delivers a lecture. Everyone listens and takes notes. That's one way to do it. But that wasn't classical uh, philosophy at all. But rather, it was a whole way of life. It was like a monastery, almost, like joining a form of life. It wasn't a medieval style, the questio disputata. That's not a lecturer coming out and talking. It's not the Oxford style of a tutor and his student, you know. So I think there's where philosophy now and theology, there are ways of life. See, I always tell my students at Mundelein, when you read the, the, the parable of the cave, which we all read in Philosophy 101, but that's so important, isn't it? Because what Plato is talking about there is that delicious moment, that, that unforgettable moment, when you really do break out of this world. Because the minute you say, and you really get it, two plus three equals five, and you get that, you really get that. It's not like, oh, there's this and there's that and then three other things. No, but you're getting it as an abstract proposition. You've left this world in some very real way. You've left the world of ordinary uh, evanescence and you've entered an eternal realm. You've, you've broken out of something, you know? You've broken into a higher world. Bertrand Russell, whom I don't like, but said at one point, uh, <laughs> mathematics is always the, is the ground of all religion. And there's something very right about that, the like Pythagoras and company, you know? It's when you break out of the evanescent everyday world into a higher world, that's of enormous spiritual significance. And I think philosophy at its best affects that sort of transformation. And then of course, theology, even a fortiori, theology is, um, is a way of life. It's a form of life. Um, you know the story about Gregory the wonder worker, Gregory Thaumaturgus, who comes to Origen and he says, I wanna learn your doctrine. And Origen said, First you will live our life, and then you will know our doctrine. See, that's right. It's like, I want to know the rules of baseball. Well, don't do it that way. Play baseball. Play baseball, and then you'll know the rules from the inside. You know? I always say that one of our problems after the council is we, it's like teaching baseball by leading with the infield fly rule. <laughs> like, you want to learn baseball? Well, first let me tell you about the infield fly rule. Well, I love the infield fly rule. It's a, it's a cool thing. It makes the game better. But see, when I was coming of age, the Catholic Church debated with itself about sex, largely, and authority, and reproductive uh, morality. Great, I mean, nothing wrong with any of that. And these are good questions uh, entertained by good people. But I submit to you as someone that grew up during that time, that does not make for compelling evangelization. You know what I'm saying? It doesn't. It's good and important, but much better, live our life. Come live our life. Come see what this is about. And then you'll understand the rules from the inside. Philosophy and theology contribute, I think, to that. You know, Please. Well, Father, um, my question is about dialogue and yeah. part of the new evangelization. So for me, like right now, sitting, for example, seeing your talk, everything's like kind of, you said, ringing the bell. It's like everything is just there, and I understand in a, what in my capacity. However, if I were to have a conversation with somebody who is, you know, a new atheist, if yeah. you will, and like you just said, it's just like they have some truth to it, but they miss the mark. It's just yeah. like, oh, it's like there's some moral truth to it, but at the same time, you're yeah. wrong. But in my mind, I'm like, oh, like, I know the answer to this, or like, but I can't get the dialogue out. And yeah. it, I'm having such a hard time, like, even going in the new evangelization. Yeah. Just because it's like, I know this, but it's like, well, I'll write you a 10-page letter. But, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, that's just my style. But yeah. at the same time, it's like in the moment, in the present moment now, yeah. you can you give me some advice or anybody here who has trouble with this? Uh. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a very good question. And I wrestle with it all the time because I'm dealing with uh, atheists all the time. And what you said, echoing uh, an earlier remark, uh, I think is the right thing, is to find the positive point of contact. There's always something in the uh, perspective being enunciated that's right. Like Herbert McCabe you know, saying to the atheist, you're absolutely right. The, the God you're dismissing, I would dismiss too. Or the view you're defending, there's something right about it. So start with that. Start with that, the point of contact. And then build on it. Say, you're right here, but I think here's the problem if you go too far. Um, so I, I always do that. Look for the semina verbi, as the father said, right? The seeds of the word. Where are the seeds of the word? Even in the most um, um, violently opposing position, you can find them. And then start with that. I think also, um, it's so hard. I know the internet thing, I get drawn into it all the time. You, you make a video or something, or you write an article, and then somebody in the com box, you know. 
and it's so infuriating. You know, you read this thing and like, what? What are you talking about? And then you come back. Count, count to ten. You know, I, I tell myself, count to ten. There's a person behind that obnoxious comment. There's a, there's a person that has to be engaged. And then try to find that point of contact. I think is is a good starting point. But also, I tell uh, Catholics, I'll tell all of you, especially young people, is um, learn the great tradition. I mean, this call at the end of my paper for a new apologetics, by God, we need it. You know, and like, oh, everyone loves us, and just reach out to the culture. Well, they don't all love us, you know. And cultures are evangelically ambiguous. There are good things, and we should, we should engage them. And there are bad things, and we should oppose them, and we should know how to oppose them. So I think learn our own great tradition so we can come at people. You know the very best guy on the web, uh, he works for Word on Fire now, is Brandon Vaught. Do you know that name, V-O-G-T? Brandon's got a website called Strange Notions that is designed to reach out to atheists. And it's really good. And he has some of the best people in the country writing with him and for him. Uh, go check out his website. Okay, thank you, Father. Please. Hold this. All right. <laughs> Howdy, Father. Hold the hat. <laughs> Good, let's get ready. Um, just a break from really philosophical, theological questions. More on the pastoral side is kind of she was talking about. Um, you talked a little bit about the beginning, in the beginning of your talk, about how new atheists and these, uh, this movement that's coming about really attacking a straw god, um, kind of the notion of what, uh, bringing about the notion of what God isn't. Uh, maybe we could, maybe you could help us figure out some ways in which to enlighten uh, the new atheists that are often under the discipleship of, say, like Cult of Dusty, The Amazing Atheist, you know, Bill Mayer, an yeah. example for on, on an ad, ad infinitum, but um, of bringing them beyond just uh, that notion of just a straw god, really getting them to think about the, a sense of religion or theology or God in itself in a, a new manner, in a light that's kind of foreign to them almost, but somehow closer to a realization of transporting what God is, um, even though we, we just talked about that. But, uh, yeah, you know, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, no, I mean, that's what the paper was about in some ways, was, was trying to do just that, is mm -hmm. there's a much richer and healthier understanding of God. And you're right, the Bill Myers and company don't have it. They don't know that. Mm -hmm. And in some, ways, in some ways, we are to blame, that we've been very poor at propagating our own view of God. Yeah, I know uh, I have. So, so that's what we have to do, I think, is re-inhabit our own great tradition, mm -hmm and bring that uh, to bear. Um, the only guy I've seen that, uh, Maher never lets people on a show that really would fight with him. He had Ross Douthat on one time. You know Ross Douthat? Writes for the New York Times, one of the only kind of traditional religious voices in the New York Times. And he was good. He was really good with Bill Maher. But um, I think resource our great tradition. You yeah. Know, use it. Go Thank ahead. you. We have just about five minutes left okay. for questions. Sure, please go ahead. Thank you, Father. Back to the uh, topic of uh, philosophy and theology a little bit and their interrelation. Um, you shared with us that when you were in high school, you had this moment um, of grace where you were kind of struck by the reality of God. Yeah. And I'm just wondering um, if you could share a few thoughts on um, the degree to which you think it's necessary to have um, those moments of grace or infused virtue of faith, as the Aquinas would call it, in order to kind of really grasp um, this metaphysical understanding of God, which you shared with us. Yeah, there's a lot to that. Um, are there preambles to the faith, to use Thomas's language? Are there rational paths we can follow, even outside of that explicit embrace of grace? Sure, and we should use those. Um, but I'm with you. I think the fullness of it comes through a, a gift, a grace, where God invites you into real intimacy and fellowship. And that is what happened to me, I think, when I was a kid, is it was an embrace of, um, of God's grace. And probably without that, you won't really get what it's meant to do. Mary Tan has this, you know, intuition to being, that sort of thing. Is that quasi-philosophical? Is it more mystical? You know, we can debate that. But I, I think you're right. I think you need uh, God's personal outreach really to lift you up into intimacy with him. You know? All right, thank you. Please. Uh, thank you for uh, your time, Father. Um, one of Thomas Aquinas's arguments for God's existence, I know, relies upon uh, an impossibility of infinite Regress. causes, yeah. regression, yeah. Um, but I've come across some people who have said that it's not necessarily the case. How would you respond to that? Yeah, it's an old uh, problem. Uh, Bertrand Russell, for example, had a really uh, 
almost comically inadequate approach to that when he said that the reason Thomas denied that was he couldn't imagine infinite sets, which certainly isn't the case. Yeah. Thomas is denying, to use the technical language, an infinite series, an infinite causal series, subordinated per se, not per accident. Thomas accepts, A, the possibility of an infinite set of things. He's no problem with that. More to it, an infinite causal series, subordinated per accident by which he means in which one element of the series is depending not immediately upon the previous one, but only accidentally. For example, I depended on my father to give rise to my being, but my father, God rest him, has been dead for a long time, and yet I'm here. I don't have a per se relationship with him right now, causally speaking. Thomas thought that kind of series could go back indefinitely. So that's a philosophical possibility, he thought. It's only a causal series subordinated per se, whereby one element is here now dependent upon the previous element. That kind of chain can't be infinite. Why? In that kind of chain alone, you suppress the first element, you suppress all subsequent elements, and therefore the contingent event you can see before your eyes. So it's that particular mode of infinite regress that Thomas denies. Oftentimes in these debates, people will bring out certain mathematical forms and this sort of thing. Yeah. That has very little to do with it. You know? yeah. Thomas would have no problem with that. It's a particular modality of a causal series that he thinks precludes the possibility of infinite regress. Thank you, thank you yes, Father. Uh, thank you, Father. I have a question um, about this idea that, you know, it's not the best strategy to lead with the infield fly rule to, yeah. you know, try to evangelize, and I agree with that completely. I wonder, do you see any tension uh, in that idea now in kind of these times where it seems that the church is under increasing attack or has to defend its kind of views on, for example, sexuality, the family, um, increasingly assertively. How do you kind yeah. of reconcile the need to win? Yeah, that's a, that's a valid point. I think something has shifted. I was talking about the time after the council when the church was largely debating with itself over these things. But you're right, something new has happened, which is a newly aggressive secularism uh, is coming after our views and especially around family issues. And I think, yes, that probably does invite, if you want, a, a somewhat more pugnacious uh, engagement. Um, so I think, yeah, that's a different game in some ways. Something has shifted. And I think we do have to be legitimately defensive. I mean, we just talked about it over dinner. I think it's so obvious that with the breakdown of the family, it's had so many implications for the breakdown of the society. And I think that point should be made clearly. And Christians shouldn't just be falling down on the canvas all the time, but we should get up and engage precisely on that point. If the family is the building block of society, as church teaching has always said, then a compromised family is a compromised society in a very deep way. So I think, you know, maybe we do need to be a bit more pugnacious there, you know. Yeah. One more? Is that, or how are we doing? Go ahead. Okay. Thank you, Father. Um, I was just wondering if you could clarify what you mean by um, continual creation versus just um, a kind of deistic perspective of God yeah. creating once and then stepping back. Yeah. And furthermore, how we can bring that understanding to others who may, who may be um, reading some of these new atheists or kind of falling for this sort of view. Yeah. No, good. I'll put it in real stark terms. Creation is the relationship that obtains between ipsum esse and finite things. That's a way to put it. And so the very act of existence itself, God, must from moment to moment sustain the being of a contingent thing, namely like you and me. Thomas says the way light is in the air. So the minute the light's gone, the air is dark. You know, It's not like heat and water where the water can maintain the heat for a while. My being here and now depends upon God at every detail. In you we live and move and have our being. And so that's what creation means. It means that. Did that obtain at the time of the Big Bang? Sure, sure. Is it obtaining now? Yeah, of course. So what's interesting is that, not so much the temporality of, oh, way back when something happened. Well, fine, let the physicists discuss that till the cows come home. Let them decide. That's not really a theological issue. The theological issue is the metaphysical one here. Thank you. All right, boy, we solved everything. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Thank you all.